right to the ground If you wanna get up You need a little revive If you wanna get up You need a little revive Dino de Toten is a zombies map that means a lot to people. With countless remakes made by fans, Treyarch devs, and even Minecraft players, if you ask any random zombies fan what their favorite map is, they're likely to respond with Kino. And it's not hard to understand why. Kino de Toten was the first map that Black Ops 1 players would unlock, as well as being a great map to train on for noobs. Mix this in with the fact that Call of Duty Black Ops is the most sold COD game of all time, and you have a recipe for success. And while it might be easy to chalk this map success up as in the right place at the right time, I think there's more to it. When I first played Kino, I was staying over at a friend's house when he passed me a controller. At the time, my parents were rather strict on the type of games that I was allowed to play, so I would always go over to his to play COD. Since it was only me and him, however, he suggested that we should play play some zombies. Now I have had previous experience playing against my friends on Nuketown, but I had never seen nor played zombies for myself. Nevertheless, we booted up a game of Kino and he showed me the basics. Told me to knife zombies on round one, showed me how you could buy weapons from the wall, and opened the first two doors for me. We fought some dogs and got down in the foyer, after which we opened the door to the dressing room, where the mystery box was. So far, it seemed like a fun mini game to me, similar to the special ops missions you could play in Modern Warfare 2. But after one small suggestion from my friend, I heard something that would spark my interest in COD Zombies for years to come. A frantic but consistent knocking emanated from the boxes in the room past the barriers, and seeing as how I was barely 10 years old at the time, it's safe to say that I didn't get much sleep that night. That memory of a creature being stuck inside a small chest banging against its container to try and get out is still deeply ingrained in me to this day. And considering the countless other creepy aspects of this map, I'm sure I'm not the only one who remembers Kino for its horror. To expand further into the knocking from the box, as many players have found, there seem to be containers in and around Kino containing what looks to be zombies. Many people theorize that these capsules contain the crawler zombies we encounter after turning on the power. These crawler zombies feature a slender body, a mutated jaw with large fangs, and an otherwise smooth head, however, while the ones in the container still retain their eyes. Furthermore, on one particular part of the map near the stairs, you can find one of these containers in an open chest that is identical to the one where the knocking can be heard. This leads me to believe that the knocking is likely due to a zombie trying to break out to come and attack the player. This little easter egg is only the beginning of this map's horror, however, as many players will experience Experience, using the teleporter to get to Pack-a-Punch has a good chance of randomly teleporting the player into four hidden rooms. The most normal of these rooms is the conference room, which is likely located in the CIA's Pentagon, as its design is identical to that of the Map 5. Containing a projector, a listening device, the logo of the United States Air Force, a TV displaying pictures of the Map Villa, and finally, a picture of Ronald Reagan. Famous for his cutscene quote, it Sounds like someone's posting cringe! The second hidden room is, in my opinion, the most interesting. Belonging to Samantha, a little girl who controls the zombies, we can see various iconic props from the zombies mode set up in a playful manner, such as various teddy bears, Coca-Cola bottles, and a monkey bomb. We can also spot dolls resembling the various player characters in what looks to be a recreation of the map de Rise carved out of wood. Something rather pleasant about this room are the sounds of children playing in the background, contrasted with the eerie whispering heard when any player visits these hidden areas. Enjoy it while it lasts, because our next two rooms are anything but pleasant. The dentist's office is a dark and blood splattered room where drills accompanied by screams of pain can be heard. In the center sits an operating chair with large lights shining downwards. On the floor, we see a large trail of blood leading into the adjacent room. If we no clip into this room, we can glimmer two distinct objects, a chair very similar to the one Mason sits in while inside the main menu, and next to it lies our second object, a decapitated zombie head, just out of view of any player looking through the glass of the office's doors. If we put all the pieces together, this seems to be a facility the group responsible for the zombies was using to conduct tests on their new experiment. A theory supported by the radio messages we will discuss later. Our fourth and final room is by far the most unsettling. A destroyed version of Samantha's room from earlier, covered in blood, 
tinting the entire room red. A large, blood-covered version of the teddy bear, featuring a red eye similar to that of the hellhounds, stands ominously over a large pile of regular-sized teddy bears. Everything in this room is destroyed. The walls, the windows, the bookcase, and the shelves are all damaged. The sounds of children playing in the previous room are now replaced with the cries of a little girl, presumably Samantha's. While these rooms may appear to be nothing more than a decision intended to scare unsuspecting players, they also have some utility, namely being the only location where film reels can be found. Given that the player only spends five seconds in any of the four rooms, they must quickly grab the film reels by running up to them and interacting with them. These film reels can be inserted into the projector of the cinema, giving us an insight into the origin of these zombies. The first of these reels shows us a scientist working on an experiment when it appears to go wrong. The second reel reveals to us who these scientists are, flashing an overexposed image of the logo belonging to the group 935, a group of Nazi scientists tasked with the creation of super weapons to help aid the Reich. And our third and final reel shows us what they've been working on, zombies. Presumably in an attempt to create super soldiers, these are the men responsible for the outbreak. The other images display displayed by the third reel are pupils dilating, as well as a blurred photo of a field. My only guess is that these are the pupils of zombies coming back to life. However, there is a core component of this mystery that I've been intentionally leaving out. That component is the various personal logs that are played when a film reel is inserted, or either of the two secret radios are shot at. The first radio can be found hanging in the chandelier in the main theater room, the other on top of a guard tower overlooking the Berlin Wall. Wait, 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 wait. the Berlin Wall is a part of Kino? Yes, the, the Berlin Wall is a part of the Kino map. I didn't know about it either, but it can be seen from the spawn area, and you can get a much closer look at it by using Noclip. Back to the messages. The person on the radio talking is Maxis, the founder of the group 935. In the first log, Maxis explains that mind control efforts have been subjected to a zombie test subject called 2-6. The test subjects have been undergoing treatment for five days with little progress. I have been assured that given time, the programming will take home. He goes on to explain that there's a lack of progress so far, but that his co-workers have reassured him to carry on the experiment. In his second log, we can again hear Maxis talk about his progress into the subconscious mind of his subjects. In the past weeks, we have made great strides in breaking through to their subconscious. I have had the projectionist make edits to the film. These changes have been very effective. He then goes on to talk about how he ordered projectionists to make edits to the film used for brainwashing, seemingly having a noticeable impact on the performance of the experiment, revealing to us that the second tape containing the dilating pupils are likely images shown to the subjects in order to brainwash them. For our third log, we hear the exciting news of a breakthrough with the Subject 2-6. Subject 2-6 has had a breakthrough. He's responding to the treatment and following basic instructions. The violent outbursts have been greatly reduced, and given time, we feel this method of treatment will be 100% effective in most cases. Claiming that the subject appears to be responding to the treatment and following the instructions of the scientists, as well as having his amount of violent outbursts, reduced. He then goes on to say that this brainwashing technique should work in the majority of cases. In the next log, Maxis announces that his intentions to use these subjects for the war effort can be put into action sooner than expected. Our timeline for deployment can be accelerated, given the progress we have made in the past two weeks. If patient 26 can obtain the impressions longer than 26 hours, we will have the process perfect. He then goes on to explain that if the impressions made by the reels can be retained by 2-6 for longer than 26 hours, that his process has been perfected. In our last log, a defeated Maxis recalls the death of the subject 2-6 after reportedly losing control during the field test. Another setback. Patient 2-6 was killed this morning in the field test. He lost control and attacked one of our handlers. His injuries were minor, but patient 2-6 was destroyed. The break in programming coincided with the flashing lights and loud noises of the fire alarm in the test facility. One moment. What is it? 
This is reportedly due to flashing lights and loud screeches of a fire alarm being activated in the facility during an active test, leading 2-6 to attack one of his handlers. We then hear a loud knock at Maxis's door, to which he frustratingly asks for patience, only to be interrupted by another knock before the log abruptly ends. If we put all this together, we come to understand that the zombies we are fighting are not corpses that have risen out of the ground like traditional zombies, but rather purposefully reanimated bodies subjected to brainwashing techniques of the Group 935. All in all, we now understand that Kino de Toten was a test facility for these experiments, and played a key role in the creation of the zombies we fight in the COD Zombies game mode. This explains the pods containing the zombies, as well as the existence of the various reels the player may stumble upon. All in all, while most rightfully remember Kino de Toten as a fun map used to teach them the basics of training, and the brief break from pursuit afforded by the Pack-a-Punch room, I will always remember Kino de Toten for that one knocking sound that forever cemented my love for zombies, and that one time that I shot myself when I was 10. Thanks for watching.